Now we're going to talk about my identity through Christ. We're going to skip in a few things for time's sake, uh, as time is ticking by, or maybe not. So my identity in Christ is what I have received through the cross of Jesus. My salvation, my healing, I'm a child of God, I'm forgiven, my righteous standing, and all these things I received through Christ. But the challenge is what I've encountered in my personal life and talking with many other people is, people cover that first part, my identity in Christ, their salvation, their eternity. Now a lot of believers and Christians are struggling with their identity through Christ. It almost sounds the same. What is my identity through Christ in simple terms? It's the purpose he has for you, your calling, your gifts, your potential, your mission, your assignment. It's what you can do on this earth for the time being that is given you. I like it how when this person said it this way, all of us are called to solve at least one problem. Law enforcement, sorry, just blew it. Uh, doctors, what kind of problems do they solve? Health problems, medical problems. Police officers, crime, crime law. I was going to say politicians. Never mind. We've got to solve their problems. <laughs> That's a problem itself. So in other words, God has equipped all of you here to solve a specific problem. Most of the time, that problem is going to seem earthly natural. For those of you who are pastors and ministers, it's beyond that. It's actually somebody's heart, uh, solving a marriage problem, uh, praying for somebody, deliverance, and so on and so forth. So whichever it is, and this is our identity through Christ. Where many Christians are struggling, what, 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 what can I do? Answer the question. Why was I born? I just come to church and I'm bored. So, how does that look like? What is my identity through Christ? First bulletin. My kingdom assignment and purpose that I must fulfill on earth. That's one of my identities through Christ. And in Jeremiah 1.5 it says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you as a prophet to the nation. If you were to read the whole context, Jeremiah begins to argue with God, I am young, Lord, who's going to listen to me? God's like, hold on, Jeremiah, I got you. Before you were born, I already knew the assignment I had for you. I knew the gift I had upon your life. What are the other things we understand for my identity through Christ? As I already talked about it, to solve a specific problem or problems. I want you to kind of understand that because there's some people who are more qualified than you to solve a certain problem. Like, hey, I'm right now... In Florida, that was last week, I have to fly back home. Who's going to solve my problem by getting me from Florida to Atlanta? The pilot. That's it. Now, I don't, I don't say that as a problem, but for me, that's a need. So if I have a need, I'm looking for somebody to help me with my need. So in Esther, we read this, 414. This is Mordecai talking to Esther. As soon as the decree came out that all the Jews need to be destroyed. This is what we're reading in Esther. Yet who knows... Whether you, that's you, Esther, have been come into the kingdom for such a time as this. At that time, the Jewish nation or the, uh, the Jewish people had a problem. What the problem was? The king listened to the wrong advisor and said, Hey, on this day, all the Jews need to be killed. That's a problem. Mordecai knew of someone who could help with the problem. Esther. Hey, Esther, go before the king. Tell him this is wrong. She had another problem. What was the problem? If I go uninvited, based on the laws, the king couldn't have my head. But God has positioned her as he said, who knows, Esther, if you were born for such a time as this to solve a problem. So here's my question to all of you sitting here. Whatever age you are right now, where you live geographically, what you're doing right now, God has allowed you and me to be here Alive in this time, in this generation, in this church. I already testified about this not too long ago when I was preaching. It took me a year to ask God, what am I doing in your life? God was talking back to me, but I was doing this like many kids. No, 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 I don't hear anything. Okay? Because God knows why He allowed you to be alive at this time, at this generation, why He allowed you to be part of a certain culture. Why you are a specific gender, why you're a female, not a male, and vice versa. God knew exactly what he was doing. Just as much as with Esther, who knows that you were born for such a time as this? Let that help you out. Why were you born for such a time as this? One more. To impact the next generation. This is a, like one of my heartbeats. It's one of our purposes through Christ. Judges 2.10. 
After that generation died, another generation grew up who did not acknowledge the Lord or remember the mighty things he had done for Israel. This is already uh, after Joshua died. Uh, another generation grew up who did not know who God was. What does that mean? If you go to your grave, this is a challenge for me and for all of us. If you go to your grave without having discovered or fulfilled your kingdom purpose, then you have robbed the next generation. That's powerful. I believe you don't have to be a father, you don't have to be a mother. You have to look at your season right now. What can I do right now that the next generation who comes after me, they're going to benefit from me? Okay? Let's use bank terminology. When you have enough money in the account, those are assets. When your account is in the minus, what are the, some of the words that they use for that? Deficit, what else? Who's the, who knows accounting here? It's not good. <laughs> Green light means good, red light means not good. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's the challenge for all of us right now. What can I do right now, Lord, that the generation that comes after me, and I'm grateful that more than 100 years ago, if I'm not mistaken, there were a couple brothers. They were not, thank God, they were not called the wrong brothers, they were called the right brothers. Who said, you know what, I, I don't like flying a kite. I want to actually put myself on a kite and start flying. They begin to experiment. And today, we have airplanes. Why? Because of the Wright brothers. That's what a W. They saw their spelling goes. They did something in their generation would see foolishness. People laughed at them. Today, more than 100 years later, we're benefiting from them. Okay? There was somebody more than 2,000 years ago did something for you and me on the cross. We know who that is. Okay. Speaking of Jesus, we I was at uh, the Zaxby's today, uh, and uh, we're at lunch, and I look at the name, and the name tag it said Jesus. I'm like, oh wow. I said, man, I, I wanted to talk to Jesus today, but I'm hungry. Jesus, can you feed me? He's like, yeah, I sure can. <laughs> but anyway, yeah. So this is very important uh, that for us to understand that we should not rob the next generation. Let's continue. When your identity and purpose is not discovered or understood, then you your value for others becomes irrelevant. In other words, if you're confused about your life, you cannot add value to others. If you're a miserable person, people around you can become miserable. If a skunk walks into this room and lets us know of its true character, what's gonna happen in the atmosphere? We will run. We're gonna run, it's gonna smell. In other words, people who do not know their purpose, wherever they go, they almost create a similar environment. This is actually, I personally believe, I experienced this on many different occasions, that the biggest troublemakers in any local church, people who cause divisions, people who oppose pastors and leaders, you know who they are? People, this is my personal interpretation evaluation, it's people who do not know their identity. If they knew what God has for them, they would have actual positions and pastor, what can I do to bring this church to the next level? But because they're struggling, they don't know who they are. They, they're confused about their salvation. Uh, they, they're, they're confused about their wholeness, their righteousness. Because they have a big mess. Now with that big mess, they're coming to the church. And it's like that skunk walking in a room and letting everybody know, I have arrived. Outwardly, looks pretty, like and white. Inwardly, in fact, with. <clears throat> anyway, even cologne would help out. Uh, second diamond here. Uh, knowing your kingdom identity will give you a clear understanding of what particular sphere you need to occupy and influence. The discovery or identity will turn your parking lot life into a valuable real estate lot. These are just some of the things for us to give us a little bit of clarity, to understand that when I know what God has given me, what God has gifted me, now I ask the question, so how can I take this gift and deposit it right now into my time, into my generation? I don't really know of any normal parent that will not go out of their way to do whatever they need to do for the success of their son and daughter. Why? Because they understand. These are my children. Or even a pastor. Pastor, hey, I'm going to do everything I can in my power, in my ability, because if I'm the shepherd and the, the ch church folks are the type of sheep, I'm going to do everything to invest into them. That's why this is also important. Can I have somebody uh, read this Bible verse? And we're going to actually take turns reading uh, this interesting, uh, I guess you say, example that we can learn valuable lessons from some of our biblical role models. Can somebody help me read First Corinthians? Look on. 
doesn't matter. Go ahead, you can arm wrestle the battle. I'm going, I'm here. All right. Curve three, James. One, twenty, seven, twenty nine. What you have, God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put the shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put the shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which is are despised God has chosen, and the things which are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. Here's a question if somebody's not afraid to uh, answer. Has anybody here ever struggled with the thought of the question of, can God really use me? Anybody ever struggle with that? Yeah. Sure. We all have? Yeah. No, seriously. Yeah. Have you ever asked yourself a question, am I qualified for this? Really, God? You think I'm the person to do this? We all have. Now that's normal. That's not you being spiritually mature. But here in the scripture it says, For God chosen the foolish things of this world. God, God does not look for the qualified person. And we're going to right now quickly go through, I'm going to actually quickly kind of glance through this for time's sake, of biblical individuals, as I like to call them role models, who they were before, and when God allowed them to know the purpose and plan he has for them, how all of a sudden their life totally changed around, the before and after. So if you're right now sitting here tonight and you're kind of struggling, really God, can you really use me to go to mission fields to preach to this and that? He can, and this will help you out. Here's before and after. Elisha, he went from plowing the fields in his family business to becoming a great prophet who carried a double portion of the anointing. And Elijah was his mentor. From plowing fields to a powerful prophet. Peter, James, and John, they went from being ordinary fishermen to becoming fishers of men. Sounds like somewhere I read in the Bible, I hope. Joseph went from being a prisoner to becoming second in command of all Egypt. Apostle Paul, he went from being a persecutor of the church, or Saul, should I say, from persecutor of the church to the most influential preacher and teacher for the body of Christ. Interesting. Who would ever thought somebody who pursued Christians right now wrote most of the New Testament? The Virgin Mary, I have to specify because there is more than one Mary in the Bible. The Virgin Mary, she went from being an ordinary virgin girl to giving birth to the Savior of all humanity. A virgin girl minding her own business, but God saw something in her that the angel said, Blessed one. Whoa, hey, where was this from? Okay. David. He went from being a shepherd boy to a victorious giant killer and eventually becoming one of the greatest kings in the history of Israel. Samuel, that's prophet Samuel. He was a small child who grew up without his siblings in the midst of a corrupt and perverted priesthood. That's Eli and his sons. Uh, but he eventually became one of Israel's greatest prophets. The missing word. Stephen. It's a very familiar name. He went from being an ordained deacon who served the widows in the tables to becoming the first martyr in the history of the church. Where uh, Saul, who was considered Apostle Paul, was a witness to that war. Should we say it was because of him and his persecution that happened. Interesting. Ordinary person, just doing his deacon stuff, is a way that I feel a greater calling. In other words, the church did not see a certain gift in his life. But God did. Next one, this one's very interesting. The nameless Jewish girl. Some of you who know your Bible, like, hey, I know who he's talking about. Why is she nameless? I still don't know her name. She was a captive and enslaved girl in Naaman's house against her will, but she gave the courage and heart to challenge her master to go to the prophet for healing for leprosy. And he received his leprosy by dunking himself into the water. Matthew, he went from being a successful tax collector to become one of the chosen disciples of Jesus who also wrote the Gospel of Matthew. Moses. He went from being a prince of Egypt to becoming the great deliverer to God's people after 400 years of slavery. Joshua and Caleb. Because of the Israelites' disbelief and disobedience, they went around the mountain for 40 years. But they were also the only two from that, their generation to enter the promised land. Additionally, Joshua was the next leader, the missing word, of the Israelites. And Caleb became a powerful general. Imagine that. From that, from that generation of who knows how many, uh, they say it was over a million, only two entered the promised land because they kept something in their heart. So no matter what season you might be going through your life, you're thinking, oh my goodness, Lord, can you really use me? And just look what's around me. God can use you as long as you remain faithful. A few more. Esther, she went from being an ordinary Jewish girl to becoming a queen who eventually liberated the Jews from their annihilation. 
Even to this day, the Jewish people celebrate this event as Purim. Ruth, she went from being a widow Gentile who risked everything by abandoning her culture to becoming part of Naomi's, that's her mother-in-law's culture, and eventually marrying a Jewish prince named Boaz. A few more. Abraham, he went from being an old childless man to becoming the father to the future generations through just one seed, and that was a son, Isaac. Three more. Nehemiah, he rose from the humble beginning as a cupbearer, living far from his own people to become a great leader who rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem in just 52 days. That's, that's a powerful testimony. A person who was really nobody and supernaturally restored the walls in 52 days. Sounds like we have 52 weeks and hey, the, the Dever book kind of says a 52 on it. Anyway, but, uh, Jacob, uh, he went from being called a liar to becoming the father of the 12 tribes of Israel, missing word, and was also given a new name, Israel. Interesting. At one point, that wife called me the little devil. After 15 years, we're back in my life. She's like, well, that's no longer the devil. He looks like a little like a saint now. So yeah, God can give you a new name. And last but not least, Rahab. This is an interesting and powerful one. Rahab the prostitute. She went from being a harlot, a prostitute, to becoming a partaker in the lineage of Jesus. Mm. I was shocked when I read in the Bible years ago. What? That lineage and genealogy Jesus, what? A harlot? Tell me God does not have a sense of humor. So when the scripture says we just read, he chooses the foolish things. So hopefully after just these few examples, you guys are going to start looking into your spiritual mirror totally differently. So I know sometimes looking in the mirror is like, ah, who's that looking at me? No. Look into the spiritual mirror of God the Father. And what the reflection you're going to get back is you are awesome. You are beautiful. You have a purpose. You have a life. You have a calling. I, I want to use you. Okay? It does not matter where you are right now in your life. This is very important. And Dwight Moody said this very funny statement. Moses spent four, well, not funny, but interesting. Moses spent 40 years thinking he was somebody, 40 years learning he was nobody, and 40 years discovering that God can do with a nobody. Interesting. This next section, I'm going to kind of skip for time's sake. Uh, when I was growing up, there was this character in the book named Where's Waldo? Yeah. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Maybe in the future classes, I'll show a little illustration. So it's this kind of goofy-looking guy in a striped hat and a striped shirt. It's like, like white and red stripes. And when you open up this children's book, there'll be like a beach setting, a city setting, and there's going to be so much colors on there. Many people building this and that, and you're supposed to find this character by the name of Waldo. Sometimes, some people, in a matter of seconds, find him. Others are looking for minutes, like, where is this guy? I mean, he stands out from the crowd. So the challenge here is you guys can do this over a personal time is we as God's children, even in the midst of all of this chaos, in the midst of so many, uh, more than 7 billion people, you still stand out. When God looks down, he doesn't see stand. Well, in my case, he sees me. When God looks down on this whole earth, he sees you. Not Stan, not Pastor Silent, but he sees you, amigo. He sees you. And this is how we need to understand God, that because he sees you personally. Okay, here's a, here's a uh, Sunday school uh, question. On the cross, who did Jesus die for? Like me. Not us. I... No, no, you're going but, but that's what we're told. Oh, yeah, he died for all of us. Sure. You need to admit he died for me. I, as some people say, if I was the only one alive in this earth, Jesus would have still wanted him across from me. That's the revelation. Okay? So you guys can kind of go through that in your own time and uh, read through that. And on the bottom we're reading. You were born on purpose to fulfill a specific kingdom purpose on this earth. On the next page, there's a reason why I inserted this uh, humorous illustration called the animal school. Uh, give credit where credit's due. This is not mine, but I believe this uh, humorous illustration that was written by George Rebus. Uh, maybe some of you have read it before, maybe not. But when I came across this illustration years ago, it, it, it totally summed up about our God-given purpose and identity in the earth. Just a small humorous illustration. Okay, let me read it for you guys. 
It's, uh, it, it's something that uh, has a powerful uh, principle here. The animal school. Once upon a time, the animals decided they must do something heroic to meet the problems of the new world. So they organized the school. They adopted an activity curriculum consisting of running, climbing, swimming, and flying. To make it easier to administer the curriculum, all the animals took all of the subjects. And it sounds like a lot of churches. Do whatever you want, however you want. So let's break it down. The duck was excellent in swimming. In fact, better than his instructor. But he made only passing grades in flying and was very poor in running. Since he was slow in running, he had to stay after school and also drop out of swimming in order to practice running. This was kept up until his webbed feet were bad and worn and he was only average in swimming. But average was acceptable in the school, so nobody worried about that except the duck. I think it sounds like education. Mm -hmm. That's not the participation trophy. Next, the rabbit started at the top of his class in running, but had a nervous breakdown because of so much makeup work in swimming. Next, the squirrel was excellent in climbing until he developed frustration in flying class, where his teacher made him start from the ground up instead of from the treetop. He also developed a charming horse from overexerting and then got a C in climbing and a D in running. Next, the eagle. The eagle was a problem child and was disciplined severely. In climbing class, he beat, up, he beat all the others to the top of the tree but insisted on using his own weight to get there, obviously flying. Next, at the end of the year, the abnormal eel that could swim exceedingly well and also run, climb, and fly a little and had the highest average and was valedictorian. The prairie dogs stayed out of school and fought the tax levy because the administration would not add digging and burrowing to the curriculum. They apprenticed their children to the badger and later joined the groundhogs and the gophers to start a successful private school. <laughs> How do we sum up this funny analogy? Because honestly speaking, this is a classic illustration of practically more than 90% of local churches. You have people with specific gifts in the wrong places, but when the people with specific gifts have to do other things, they do not function in their strongest gift, and things become chaotic. So how do we sum this up like this? This short but humorous story perfectly encapsulates the modern day tragedy that we frequently encounter in the local churches, the marketplace, and everyday society, or our own families. We see that visible in politics, don't get me started, and everywhere else. Okay? So hopefully this uh, kind of humorous uh, story can draw an illustration that each of those animals have a specific gift. Just like all of you have a specific gift. And the challenge for all of us as a church or as God's children is, what is my specific gift? What value can I bring into my local church? Not, well, I want that. Okay, I qualified for that. Like I said, you guys don't want me with the same microphone sitting in a worship this Sunday. You don't. I'm telling you. I don't have to convince you. I'm going to scare the whole church out. They're going to say, Pastor, what we'll come to church again as long as that guy's not sitting in that, in that yellow shirt, you know what I mean? That's not my gift. And I'm not even striving for it. That's not my area of strength. But the, what happens is when people don't understand their specific gifts and uniqueness, they try to force themselves into that, and as we're at, they became average instead of excelling them. So let's kind of finish up uh, with a few more things, and we'll wrap it up. So, first bulletin. Individuals with specific talents, qualities, skills, and distinguishing characteristics can be found all around us, but they are forced or made to do things that are not in their best abilities, as we talked about. Or, too many Christian leaders, pastors, and church folks are attempting to make ducks jump like rabbits, rabbits fly like eagles, or squirrels swim like ducks due to lack of vision, experience, or people skills. In other words, I believe God has equipped all of us to help each other out. To add value to each other, not to frustrate each other. And the last one. God has given each individual specific gift, talent, skills, calling, and purpose. And as a kingdom leader, you guys are all kingdom leaders. You're going to hear this term a lot throughout this, uh, uh, these 16 sessions. Kingdom leader, you must assist that individual in discovering their God-given identity so that they can mature 
and grow to their fullest potential. This is why you're here. You can grow. If God, spiritually speaking, calls you to be a rabbit, don't try to be an eagle. Oh, but it sounds so fun. I know, but the eagle cannot run like the rabbit. You see what I mean? Just as a metaphor. 